I'm, I'm just, I'm not willing to admit that out I, on live, even though oh, I realize we're live. Okay. It'll Let just me be just our be secret. clear for the record then, everybody, I'm madly in love with Manny's EPD logo going on and behind him, and I'm feeling like uh, obviously a little belittled at this point, but that's okay. That's normal for me with when Manny's involved. Well, Manny, you've definitely stepped it up. I don't, I can't remember a guest um, doing a background like this. So, you know, thanks for stepping it up. And then Chris, your house looks beautiful in the background as well. So. You know, uh, well, I, I, yeah, I'm, I, we're, we're bullshitting ourselves, but that's okay. Ma the Manny part's are absolutely accurate. So now I'm going to go and figure out how you put that. I, I see when I'm on a bunch of team calls and stuff, especially Matt Moreau, he's got this like sick expo background going on where it looks like we're at the top of like, I don't know, a tower in downtown New York city or something. And that's head office. <laughs> like, Oh, you're going to show me how to do that. Yep. This is the first time I've actually done a virtual background and because everybody was giving me such flack for the blank wall behind me. And so I said, you know what, tonight uh, in, in, in the company of Eric and Chris, I'm going to step up my background game. No, let's be clear. He said, what I'm going to do is make Chris look like shit, which is uh, mission no. accomplished. No, would never do See, that. See, if you guys really want to know, I'm not, even capable, and, I'm not even capable of doing that. If you guys really want to know how 3M and Expo get along, now you see. <laughs> you fucking can't stand each other. Well, this is oh. a no holds barred uh, podcast, so <laughs> let's, let's get ready to rumble. This is, this is going to be interesting. So, right, Eric, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to steal your thunder. Go ahead, my brother. No, no, no. This is a perfect intro. Intro is the hardest part. Then it gets rolling. So you made it easy. Um, no holds barred. I went through last a couple weeks ago's video, grabbed some questions. I figure we could start there, but obviously anybody can ask any questions in the comments. And of course, we'll get to those as well. So really the format is question and answer as I understand. And then we go wherever it goes. Okay. So um, first I have some screenshots of actual questions, but I wanted to talk, touch on the topic of corporate stores. That seems to be one that came up. Um, it came up specifically um, in actually in, yeah, in the one with Chris. And essentially the question is, um, Nick Karamitros Kara asked, you know, if it's true that Expel is opening up auto spas next to or close to high volume dealer locations, um, or is it simply a rumor? Oh, so, it's uh, look at this is a this is something that's been um, rumored forever. This is not a new rumor. Um, it's resurfaced recently with a competitor in particular who's actually trying to spew the same bullshit. And I really laugh because you can see which competitor it is, and they're a tiny little fucking gnat of a company. But at the end of the day, they're trying to create ripples. And I won't say the company name, of course, because that's not my 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 style, but. At the end of the day, look, are, do we have corporate stores? Yeah. And are, are we proud of them? We absolutely are. Many of them have been acquisitioned because the store owner has approached us and said, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to retire. I don't have anybody that wants to take over the business that I feel comfortable with. Or, hey, I understand that you like the idea of acquisition. Is this something you're interested in my operation? And then we look at the operation. We figure out if it strategically makes sense or not. Have we ever opened up a store from, from scratch? We have done that too. Uh, you know, Houston is an example. We did that like many years ago when there was very little footprint of Expel. As a matter of fact, it wasn't even using Expel window, uh, Expel PPF at the time it was actually 3Ms. And, uh, you know, we, we realized that we had a, a, a situation that had presented itself where we thought, oh, okay, well, this makes sense. So where and when do we do it? Well, there's a number of times where we'll look to do it. Number one is, is what geographically are we speaking about, right? If it's in a market where we don't have anything going on right now in internal as in a corporate store, it's worth us investigating because we like to test our products in real world environments and have real answers, right? When we talk to customers about ceramic coating and they're saying, well, in my market, it's really hot and humid. And so your coating flashes too quickly. If we don't have a, a, a center ourselves that's in a hot and humid place, it's hard for us to answer that. When we look at like a lot of acid rain that goes on in Asia, well, obviously having a corporate store there would make a lot of sense for us to be able to test our PPF and our coating and how it will weather. When we look at like how UV indexes will impact window film and degradation and coloring and 
you know, the, the PSAs and all that sort of stuff, again, makes a lot of sense. Not only that, but a lot of times it uses a distribution hub. So one of the things a lot of customers are, are accustomed to with their, current, with their current supplier is they might have a lot of local distribution. And we don't, right? We don't have redistribution of our product is where I'm going with that. Um, and so with that in mind, that has, a, has capped us and that, hey, sometimes you might have an ability to drive down the road and pick up product from your local supplier and you can't do that with us. We were having everything distributed out of San Antonio for, for the US, everything out of Montreal for Canada. Now we have Montreal, Mississauga, Calgary. Mississauga and Calgary have both been from acquisition of existing operations. Uh, in the US, we now have Fullerton. We now have, uh, uh, sorry, Char Charlotte. Charlotte was really strategic, right? Mike Burke, uh, our, our main uh, window film buyer of the entire United States, headquartered in Charlotte. It was obviously uh, smart for us to put something in his backyard to service his nine local stores, plus the Eastern Seaboard. Boise was an acquisition. Uh, you know, Mike Mail, who's been an amazing uh, um, attribute to the company, that was acquisition, that's Vegas. Uh, San Antonio, well, that's head office. So again, that, that goes without saying. But like, you know, it's funny. I, I had this amazing experience last weekend, John Gray from Gulf Shield. And I know that when, when John Gray was first made aware of us opening corporate, he is our, by the way, our biggest Texas buyer. So for all of you that are trying to go after our number one customer or biggest customers, hey, here's some food for you. Go ahead, try and grab them from us. Um, <laughs> You know, John was not for us bringing on our own expo shop in the area, right? Our biggest Texas customer, wow, we're pissing off our biggest Texas customer. Oh, shit. Should we, should we hold back on this? But we're like, look, John, trust the process. We promise you that this is only going to be better than, better than ever before for you. There's lots of reasons why. Number one, obviously, now we're going to do some localized marketing in a way that we wouldn't have before. We don't strategize the marketing just for our own stores. We strategize the marketing, yes, to support our store, but obviously support the overall local market. Number two, John had a situation. He's got a big operation, lots of installers. One installer caught COVID. Guess what? Gave it to the entire team. He went from literally having 14 people in store to having nobody overnight. We actually turned around and said, hey, let's send our installers from our shop. Let's tell our retail customers we can't service them in the timeline that we expected. COVID's happened. Let's send a bunch of the installers over to John and help him out. That's what we did. You know, now when John's got a situation where he has an unexpected uh, opportunity that arises with film that he doesn't have in stock. And of course he stocks a lot of film, but there are the occasional ones where he doesn't for flat glass, especially he just drives over to our, 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 our shop and picks it up directly. Right? So are we looking to continue to expand factory stores? The answer is definitely yes. But like, is it like the Amazon bullshit where, hey, Amazon's paying attention to where there's the biggest sales in a product skew. And so they're going to go out and duplicate the product skew and steal that business over. That's the part that's pure bullshit. And, and that's definitely not happening. And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of talk right now in the street from one of our, one of my favorite competitors who's supposedly now actually doing the exact same thing. I'm not going to say that it's the truth yet. I'll wait to see that it's been announced officially, but there's a many, there's a lot of people talking about this and we'll see if it's, if it's actual or not. Maybe it's all bullshit. I don't know. Cause of course, rumors in this industry are like the easiest thing to spread on the, on the entire planet more than high school or grade school. Uh, I don't think the 3M has any corporate stores and you know what, if they don't, then I get it, but maybe Manny knows if they do or don't. And if they, and if they do or why, and I'm, I'm sure that they would have it for the same reason as us. Yeah, 3M doesn't have any corporate stores in the United States that I'm aware of. It might be something that they've done overseas uh, and uh, historically, and I don't know if they still do it today. Um, but in the United States, 3M doesn't have any corporate stores. They go to market through dealers. And, and I understand both sides of the argument. On, on one hand, an installer or dealer doesn't want to feel like they're competing against their supplier. The notion is the supplier has a lower cost factor. They feel that it's unfair. Totally understand that. And maybe if I was a dealer, I would think that way. The flip side of the argument, and we've talked about this in the past, Eric, is that manufacturers have to grow in one way, shape or form. That growth pleases uh, Wall Street. It 
funds R&D for new products that benefit the channel, including the dealer who may not like having to compete against his or her manufacturer. So uh, there are a lot of pros and cons to that model. And I think ultimately, if you're somebody that doesn't like competing against your manufacturer just for the sheer, just out of just just in principle, well, then you, you, you may need to go with a manufacturer who doesn't have that business model. Um, but again, I, I think sometimes, and I can't stress this enough, and maybe my position is somewhat unique because I'm in the middle. Um, you know, I'm in the middle between the dealer and the manufacturer as a distributor for 3M. I see both sides and I understand the pressure a manufacturer is under to grow. And um, that requirement of growth is on every manufacturer, whether or not the manufacturer talks about it. Expel's a publicly traded company. 3M's a publicly traded company. There are other manufacturers in this industry that are publicly traded. They're under pressure for growth. Plus, even if they're not under pressure for growth from Wall Street, they might pressure themselves because that's in their organizational DNA. So I, I do think it's it's important not to underestimate the importance of growth to a manufacturer, but also recognize that growth does fund additional improvements in product and program and marketing and things like that. So when you're uh, in the position of a dealer and you're always making suggestions to your manufacturer about why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Well, there has to be profit dollars to do this and to do that. And that a lot of times does come from growth. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add a little bit to it too, right? Something you said, which was really cool at the end there, which is a lot of times you're hearing from shops that are saying, hey, why don't you do this or why don't you do that in terms of product change? Maybe make the film a little easier to install, a little more stretch, a little more grippy in the glue, a little less grippy in the glue, you know, a little better scratch coating. Well, the reality is that we have not only their information to rely on with, but we have our own to compare it. And that is a that is a really big advantage for us. And again, I, I literally agree with everything that Manny just said. I can understand why somebody would be like, I'm not interested in working alongside a manufacturer that has corporate stores. Hey, if that's the case, I, I get it. No, nope, we're not going to be offended by it. Uh, I'm not interested in obviously trying to convince you otherwise. Uh, I'll let my other clients talk to it instead that are in those markets to say how well it works out for them. But the last part is that we also come in typically at the highest price, right? One of the worries that people have is that one of the things you're going to do, like Manny alluded to, which is that, hey, clearly I theoretically pay less for my own product than the people that I sell to. That That is sensible, right? So do I have a competitive advantage? Well, we all know that film costs especially are a very minimal portion of the actual overall part of the cost of doing business, right? It's the, really the labor that we're all making money on. Even if the film cost was pretend half price, which we don't, we book it internally at the same price our shops pay so that we can use real world metrics in terms of how to design out a shop's growth. But even if we didn't, the reality is that on a full front end, instead of it being, call it $300 worth of material and PPF, it's gonna be 150 bucks. Is that really making a difference in a $2,000 ticket? No. And am I gonna use that $150 advantage to try and sway the clients towards me instead of my shops? No. We built our business off of, you know, obviously brick and mortar operations and dealership operations and obviously dealer services operations. And we're not looking to stop that. And I do realize that it's a difficult conversation and a topic piece, but again, it, it works really well for us. And it's what really helps, uh, really helps us to generate those new product offering lineups that people are looking at, not just from the profit standpoint, but from the real world application standpoint that we're doing it ourselves. And we can verify what they're saying on, on average. Make sense? Totally. Great question though. Yeah. I mean, it, um, I think you both nailed it and it comes from fear of loss, right? Like it's, it's fear that something's going to be taken away. And like, I, I, I definitely think, you know, there's a huge advantage to you doing business like that for everyone. And then there's also you know, there's nothing wrong with somebody saying, I want to be with a company that doesn't do that. Right. And that is like the market, like that is business. And you have to, if you can't embrace that, there should be two sides to things. Um, you know, that's, I think just well, you, like, you, you have, have the choice value. to pick or choose, right. You, I mean, really right. you're not losing anything. You, you, you have the choice to go with a brand like 3M and great. Thank you, Manny, by the way, I, I, I figured that they didn't have any corporate stores, but I didn't want to say that ca categorically. But I mean, look, you know, I've always said 3M is an incredible brand. Eastman's an incredible brand. Expel's an incredible brand. You should probably be brand specific, 
That's that's how I feel. I'm never going to change that opinion. And so if Expel doesn't suit your needs, 3M will. And 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 they'll do it happily and and you should be very content and and not be like <clears throat> trying to pick a fight with Expel because they're not doing it the same way. You should just be like, "Hey, cool. I get it. I understand. Move on and make your choice." And to your point about, you know, being able to use a real world environment to develop how a store should be and, and, and so on in that process. I just, speaking from my own experience, six, seven years ago, I was thirsty for that sort of example in my own business because I would see glimpses of shops overseas and I would be like, what do they have going? What does their showroom look like? What is, because you didn't see so many shops like you do now on Facebook. And, you know, like that's tremendously valuable. I think like if, if I'm an Expel dealer, I want to look at Expel shops and say, let me see what these people that obviously have all the resources and, um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, experience and knowledge and so on. Like, what do they find important? What does their layout look like? What, what do they have? What do they have in their garage? What is how many people per, per you know, square foot and, and so on? And what does their pricing look like? Like, I want that example as a business. You don't want to be shooting in the dark. You want to go, that's it. Now I can go do it and do it confidently and over and over. Yeah, I just got an email not even a half an hour ago from Chris West giving me a lot of shit. And it was because we 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 have so we have obviously a number of corporate stores located all over the place. And what we will do is we will encourage operations to actually go to our corporate store to see how it's operating, to see how we're handling sales, to see how we're handling displays, to see how we're handling installations. And and Chris was sending me an email because obviously we should make the store manager aware of this. And we just showed up. We just had some clients show up just yesterday without any foreknowledge to the shop, to the, you know, to the shop, shop manager, which of course is not, which is not a good thing. But I agree with you. Like, I, I do believe that, that from my perspective, when a shop says to me, hey, I want to know how to run my business more effectively and efficiently, we're not talking marketing. We're not talking, you know, uh, uh, how, to, how to negotiate a better term on your lease or something, but you want to understand how to run your business effectively? No problem pick any one of our shops. Every one of them was overseen by Chris West. Of course, we all know who he is and how incredible his shop was. And he's, he's managed to make that the same with, within all the shops. So we do have some real world uh, opportunity for you to take a look at. But again, I don't want to discredit what, what Manny's saying. If it's not for you, it, it makes total sense to me that it's not for you. And, and, and I'm not interested in trying to convince you. Well, and as a manufacturer or distributor, like you don't actually have to own a shop to provide that sort of guidance for your dealers either, right? It's just one way to do it, but like it's not one a requirement to, to provide that sort of uh, guidance and so on. Anything 100%. else to kind of close out the topic, Manny? No, no. I, I, I think I've stated my perspective on it. I see both sides and everyone's got to make the choice that's best for them, just like a manufacturer has to make the choice that's best for it. If question goes to, goes to both um, Chris and Manny, I'm curious if you were if you were maybe working for a shop now, maybe subcontracting, about to kind of step on your own and, and take your business to the next level. Um, so you're kind of in that starting stage, or maybe you have a small shop and you, you know it's you're looking to maybe get into a new space and and take yourself to a next level. Um, would it be focused on automotive or flat glass, or would you suggest both? Go ahead, Chris. Well, I mean, look, I think automotive for a lot of people is their comfort point, right? And that, you know, most of us are car fans or car fanatics, been around cars since we were kids, maybe playing with dinky toys or whatever. And, and in turn, we're suddenly like something sexy about it. So I think that for a lot of people, they believe that that market is the market that they should focus in. But I, I can tell you right now that the biggest opportunity as far as I see it, is flat glass. I mean, I think that, 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 that you make the most money per hour, per square footage with the least amount of pain. The sales cycle might take a little longer, especially on the commercial opportunities because you're putting in bids and waiting for these bids to get reviewed and then get approved and make sure they fit in with that year's budget versus next year, what have you. This is, in fairness, a, a much bigger specialty of, of especially Manny and EPD. Manny and EPD is like a pain in my ass, thorn in my side when it comes to flat glass. They dominate the flat glass market by a long shot on the Eastern seaboard. And as much as I would love to try and steal as much of that away from him, 
it's going to be really hard because they they have so much to offer within that space that that I that I I just I'm I'm not there yet. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's a hard answer. You know, it's it's an answer again. But ultimately, what what do you feel is where you're you know you're going to have your success with if you're not aware of how to go out and bid on jobs and and understand what that sales cycle looks like and things of that nature, then you might become like unfortunately disenchanted with it. But I think that Manny would probably agree with me and that if you stick with it and 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 you get more interaction, especially with, you know, your your brand and in, in Manny's case, you know, the, the distributor, that that long term, there's a lot more opportunity, I think, in flat glass than auto. And I would drop auto and do strictly but strictly flat glass if I had especially an unlimited bank account to get through the first year in order to build my book of business. But that's my opinion. I don't know what Manny's is. Well, before I answer the question, first, thank you, Chris, for that. And the opposite is true on the automotive side. You and Expel have been a thorn in, in our sides. And, uh, it, you know, quite frankly, 3M strength on the architectural side is mirrored by Expel strength on the automotive side. And I can say that having gone against you in the streets, um, my perception as an outsider is that, you know, the, your go-to-market strategy has really redefined Expel. Uh, and, and I think just fast forward five years since we started butting heads, um, Expel is where it is and it's in a wonderful spot automotively. Architecturally, I would agree that, you know, 3M is in a similar position. And so um, my strength or my background has always been um, architectural or flat and relative to residential or commercial, commercial, because as a distributor, that's what that's the market we can mostly impact. Um, someone looking to get into the industry right now, I think it's an interesting time because there is a potential recession looming ahead. I think that has to play a role in it. I think certainly the automotive business is a little bit easier to get started in terms of kind of hit the ground running. And the presumption is that you can have um, an incomplete marketing strategy and still have people calling you and walking through your door. So you have a customer base in that regard. I do agree with Chris that in the long term, the real money is with flat and there's a ton of opportunity coming up in flat, but it takes a long time to go after that business, not just logistically and setting up a company and developing a business plan and a marketing strategy and executing it. But to Chris's point, especially on the commercial side, there is a long sales cycle. And so, um, you know, if you think you're just going to all of a sudden open up a flat glass business and the next day the phone's going to ring, you're mistaken. That's more likely to happen on the automotive side. And of course, when you're starting something out, you may have cash flow issues. You may not be able to sustain the phone not ringing or go without sales and things like that. So you, you have to make your decision very, very, very carefully based on your, you know, your, your resources. Um, but if money's no object and we're talking about sheer opportunity, I think the opportunity is on the architectural or the flat side. Yeah. See, you know, now you know why I don't like to, 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 to speak when he's on, on this thing with me. Because he hit it on a whole bunch more topics than I did and sounded insanely more professional. Uh, remind me never to do this again with him. <laughs> Teamwork. It is. I can't hold my own like Chris can, though, on, on these tough questions that uh, his customers and non-customers hit him with. That was probably about two podcasts ago, Chris. You know the one I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, I, I listen. Eric Scott, I know it was his podcast. That was, an inter- <laughs> that was a very interesting podcast, and it was the first no holds barred, and and it was really yeah, interesting. Yeah, I like and these I, no holds barred. I had a lot of fun with it, and I of course loved your uh, loved your comments and and accolades with regards to how I handled myself afterwards. So thank you. Oh, for sure. Well, well deserved. But no, these these are good, great questions, and and Eric, I know you're the one asking them, and. You know, your viewers out there probably uh, want to know certain things. And I think there's a new spirit of cooperation and open dialogue within the industry where information flows a lot more freely and it helps everybody understand everyone else's position. And I think um, we're able to now work together and all that does is positively impact the industry, which I think in turn, whether directly or indirectly, uh, brings more people in, that creates more marketing, that creates more awareness. And then all of a sudden, this 56-year-old business that has taken the longest time to achieve any kind of high single-digit market awareness, all of a sudden gets to that next level. And then you see the penetration rates 
uh, hopefully increase exponentially. And I think we're entering into that new era now. Um, and I think a lot of people are taking notice and it's just winning begets winning. So the a growing industry brings in more people, more people continue to market and that creates growth and it's, it's a cycle. Yeah. And flat glass is just, just so, so the awareness is still just so, so minimal, so minuscule. Um, even compared to the, you know, we'll talk about like paint protection penetration. There's still so much more room, automotive tint, so much more room. But then like when you go to resident, like special like residential flat glass, I think there's, it's, it's even just so much more room. Like people just have no idea. And um, you know, when homes, we talk about cars being, it's pretty cool that now cars can be $400, $600, $1,000 and, and maybe up. Um, you know, homes can be $3,000, $8,000, $12,000. And those are really nice chunks of change that you can bring in in a day, two days, and you're in and out. And people don't look through their home windows as carefully as they might their car windows either. It is, in my experience, and to Chris, kind of you touched on it, like less of a pain in the ass in a way. Like you're in and you're out. And of course, it has its challenges, but you're not crawling in somebody's brand new $300,000 leather, you know, just drop. Totally. I mean, the, the only thing I'll add to that is that while residential is probably like you said, completely an untouched market overall, I, I think, and I'm pretty sure that Manny will agree with me that right now, the biggest opportunity is probably going to be in low E uh, films instead. You know, this mandate of, of climate control as best we can and getting your, you know, your, your energy efficiency up as high as you possibly can is very real, right? And it's been put into law in a number of cities, and I think you're going to see that continue. And so I, I do believe that obviously really strong companies like 3M, which dominates the flat glass market. I mean, let's, let's not bullshit each other. That's a reality. Uh, I think that you're going to see that that's going to be a, you know, a really good uh, opportunity for them to continue to, to, to master that and maintain that and, and crush it. Yeah, I, I do agree with you, Chris, and thank you for that. Um, the opportunity that, that the industry is seeing with respect to energy conservation, which is really probably the um, catalyst for creating the op opportunity 56 years ago, and energy conservation in this country comes and goes in waves. And we're at the, you know, we're at the most recent wave right now. Um, and energy conservation takes on a whole new meaning because we typically think of reducing air conditioning costs. And that's what the industry is geared to thinking. But the truth is, especially in northern climates, what we're really now talking about is reducing heating consumption. And so um, when you take northern climates across the stretch, you know, from east coast to west coast, um, not only reducing your air conditioning expenses, but also your heating expenses or your consumption, I should say. And the same is true for Southern climates, but the focus is mostly on your air conditioning consumption. So that's creating a lot of opportunity for a lot of different manufacturers and everyone's really got to go out and chase it because still there is low market awareness, uh, Eric, relatively, I mean, absolutely speaking, there's low market awareness, but relative to what we're used to, there's higher but it's still not to the point where um, someone, a commercial decision maker looking to reduce their uh, consumption or increase their energy efficiency is going to necessarily know. There's a relatively inexpensive piece of polyester that goes on your glazing that uh, reduces the windows solar heat gain coefficient and U value to the point where um, the savings or the consumption reduction is substantial. So, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity ahead of us with respect to the architectural market. I feel like that opportunity is something that like manufacturer wise, you, I would imagine would be very important because that's glass that is going to get film on it. And you want to see it with your film on it down your channel somehow. I feel like as a dealer for 99.9% .9 of dealers out there, that's like the highest hanging fruit because it's the longest sales cycle. It's the energy like conservation models. It's the, you know, um, prevailing wages. It's the extra insurances. It's like the long, like waiting to get your money. It's like all those things that like, you're talking sometimes six months a year. I feel like companies like solar art, um, Campbell window films, like window film depot, like these like larger companies that specialize in national projects are going to be the ones that are like, even begin set up for the, for the 
hassle that goes into that. And I guess like, I just, I feel like at least from my own experience that like the, like the low hanging fruit is these beautiful big homes that everybody's building where you can walk into a home and out of home in the same day and, and have an $8,000 check. And you know, your film cost was 2000, your labor might've been 2000 and you have $4,000 and you didn't do a thing. And then you do three of those in a day and you're like, you don't have cash flow issues. Like they're paying you on the spot. Like I'm just saying like the way, like that's just kind of my, like for most people in a shop versus now, if, if you have manufacturer support, then I think it changes everything. Right. Because like, you're going to need a big crew. You're going to need a lot of film. You're going to need these energy conservation models. You're going to be like potentially putting, I forgot what they're called, but the, you know, to gauge the temperature throughout the day and the hours and, and, and get, gather all that, gather all that data. And then after that, you may not hear anything or the price might suck. And like for most tin shops, I just think that's like so far out of like possibility. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, Eric. I think certainly when you look at a skyscraper, a dealer may get intimidated by the process necessary to go out and close it. Um, your larger dealers, like the ones you've mentioned, and even some of the larger local or regional ones, uh, do a marvelous job of chasing down opportunities, creating awareness, and ultimately um, closing projects and installing film. Um, our dealer network, uh, I'm very proud of. I think they do a fantastic job of developing opportunities. Um, we look at it as our job to support them, uh, which we do, but we also try to develop opportunities on our own on their behalf. And, you know, from the standpoint of what is easiest to chase, what's the lower hanging fruit? Yeah, residential is easier. It's profitable uh, from a per square foot basis. It pays quickly. You don't have to wait for your money, things like that. Um, but a couple things. One is, as a manufacturer, you've got vested interest in doing more commercial projects because more film is moved, right? So the manufacturer charges the same whether the film is sold for a house or for a building, but the dealer doesn't. And this kind of goes into what we were talking about earlier, which is the pressure man which is the pressure that a manufacturer is under to grow because ultimately, when they do grow, that does benefit their their network um, ultimately. Um, and so, you know, I think manufacturers have a vested interest to develop these projects on their own as well in conjunction with their dealers, but they're not easy and they do take a long time. Uh, we typically say the average sales cycle for a project is 18 months, independent of anything Chris was talking about from a market factor standpoint with legislation. Um, and in some cases, um, I know dealers uh, who've worked on projects for 20 to 30 years before they've closed it. And I don't say that to discourage anybody. But I think what Chris was alluding to is going to change the game, right? Uh, I think it's going to put pressure on the buying, on the, on the decision maker in a good way for us to the point where I don't want to equate it to shooting fish in a barrel. But I think it's a lot easier to sell window film when, when the end user comes to you versus you having to go to them, point out a problem that they have, whether they realize it or not, and that you offer a solution to that problem. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll back up, obviously, like, again, like, look, um, you know, not to compare uh, anybody on our team to 3Ms for sure, but like, you know, we, we, we had this incredible acquisition of Veloce, but the reality is everybody knows that as great as Veloce was, the whole reason for the acquisition was to get Harry Rahman, right? So we asked Harry, hey, come in and literally strip us of our existing product lineup and come up with something that's a lot more impressive. Okay, great. And, and he's done so. Like Vision 2.0 product lineup, I don't, again, not to sound uh, com uh, combative or anything like that, but I would put it up against almost anybody's uh, flat glass lineup, uh, not including decorative. When, But at the end of the day, you know, you have operations like, Sunstoppers is a really good example. Do they do commercial? Yes, for sure. But it's not their bread and butter on their flat glass operation. The bread and butter on their flat glass operation is exactly what you said. The, the easy, if you will, opportunities, right? Uh, having, a, uh, having a retail customer that comes in the store that deals with them on an automotive side saying, hey, by the way, did you understand that we could also do this for your home? And then, hey, we're actually in your neighborhood tomorrow with one of our you know, vans. Would you like to stop by and provide a free quote? And then they get in there and they close the deal right on the spot and they get their money on the spot because it's through Square and everything. That's a really interesting model. And that's why I think Sunstoppers is very successful at flat glass while not focusing on these massive opportunities. However, I 100% I believe that 
the massive opportunities that are going to continue to come along, especially in this energy conference conservation for these big buildings is much more lucrative and much larger. And because it's going to be mandated, you know, look, you can only make your, your air conditioning so efficient or your heating, you know, units so efficient. What do you do afterwards? Okay. Well, now you re-insulate. Okay, great. Well, what's next? And there's a, an ongoing battle to continue to improve it. So, you know, window film on their glass is going to make a very dramatic impact. And so I, I agree that I think that the time is coming where the phones are ringing, asking you, please come and help us out. We need to do something and we need to do something now. That, that time is right around the corner. And if you can invest in that now, it's, it's very wise. You know, I think that it's fair also to say that like, especially for me with my client base and, and I, sh I don't mean mine as my personal, but, but I'm being a little uh, ownership wise is that it, it, Expel is automotive focused. You know, that was a, another reason for Harry. Like we needed, we knew that this was a, a, a massive deficiency for us. We need to bring Harry in and let Harry develop his team with Carol and others underneath them to, to understand that we need to go after flat glass opportunities, flat glass operators that don't even have automotive. Because the automotive guys, I, I agree more than likely are not going to try and go after that long sales cycle opportunity. And so rather than us just like trying to convince them or push them, into an uncomfortable position to be much smarter to try and somehow miraculously steal one of Manny's customers from him. Never going to probably happen, but I'm going to try. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, for the, for the dealer who's focused automotively to be going after the opportunities that we're talking about, that's probably not going to happen um, without really a mind shift. It's a, well, or a paradigm shift really, because, um, you're not just going to bump into that opportunity because you install tint or paint protection foam on a car. You really have to look at a separate business model that you resource properly to go out and um, market and develop opportunities. Um, historically, I think dealers have to create their own opportunities. And, and that's what we've done for 56 years. I do think with what we're doing now, or excuse me, the market conditions that are now true that, Chris and I have been alluding to, I think that brings opportunity to us for the first time. Um, and this is a, this is a terrible way to um, explain it, but it's very similar to God forbid something happens at a school where there's a shooting, right? There's always that event triggers demand for window film or a polycarbonate or bullet resistant glass or something that um, enhances the safety of a school. Um, Energy policy, which is really, well, I should say energy, uh, economic and political factors that are at work are creating opportunities that are now coming to the industry, coming to us for window film, all in order to increase the energy efficiency of buildings. We got through two questions in 30 minutes. Man, I love it. <laughs> yeah, what's the third one, Eric? Where's, where's the controversy? No, it's me. I, I'm talking too damn much is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I'll save the controversial for the one right after this. <clears throat> um, let's say you're a shop doing three to $500,000 a year. It's one to three people in that shop. Um, and you've tossed around money for marketing. It hasn't landed anywhere. You're looking to start fresh and you're asking your buddy, Chris and your buddy, Manny off the top of your head. If you had to earmark a number, if it was you, what range would you say out of that 500,000 gross sales, three to 500,000, what percentage or range would you start off um, with marketing? Is there anywhere that just comes top of mind to where that would be allocated? Broadly. I'll defer to Chris on this one, that, you know, especially because it's really automotive, which is so. I mean, not I, a I like to try. I, I like to try and dedicate ten percent of revenue to marketing. I think that that's a very healthy number if you can afford it. There are times when you can't, right? I mean, sometimes people are unfortunately operating a lower margin, perhaps because of the brand that they're currently using, where it's an unknown commodity, and maybe because they're a newer operation too, right? I mean. The fact is, and one of the reasons I've said this many times in the past is that like, if I'm a new operation, I'm only going to partner with extremely well-known companies. And the, the two that most come to mind is 3M and Expel. Now Eastman is an amazing competitor of ours for sure. Absolutely. But I think that it's fair 
to say that 3M and Expel have put a lot more emphasis in B2C strategy and marketing platforms than Eastman, no disrespect to them. So now knowing that if I'm not with one of those two recognized brands, now I have to put in more effort than ever before, right? If I'm with any other brand other than those two, there's no doubt that market awareness is obviously going down dramatically. And so that's where that marketing strategy is going to be required, you, you know, to move on to that next level, to do what, you know, the Josh Popanix did and the Ray Van Dexter's did and T on an AP3 and all these other operations, you know, you, you reach that three to $500,000 threshold and you're like really nervous and scared, almost like, how do, how do I get to that million dollar mark? What is that going to look like? I mean, I was just talking to Brett and Tiffany at All-American not that long ago and you know, I can remember when I met them four years ago or whatever, and they're working in that one base shop that wasn't even owned by them. And now they're in their 6,500 square foot shop. And I don't know if they'll be okay with me, but they're, 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 you know, they're, they're way into the seven digits. Right. And they were, you know, that three to $500,000 mark at max before. Uh, I, I, I think that the way you're going to achieve moving on and upwards, if you will, is, is with a marketing strategy. And that includes in the downtimes, guys, there's a lot of people who think that right now you need to pull back on the purses because maybe there's a recession coming. And I'm like, look, you know, that I don't think is correct. I think that now is the time you need to focus on marketing more than ever, because ultimately consumers are still going to be purchasing and ultimately they're going to try and make a decision based on what something they're finding, something they're locking on to. So if you can, if you can, if you can put aside 10% of a marketing budget, that's really healthy, but you need to spend it wisely. Right. I mean, it's not just as simple as saying, hey, well, I'm going to give three thousand dollars into Facebook campaigns and talk to Jared and Jessica. You know, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to want Jared and Jessica who do a great job of planning out a, a good strategy for me and showing me why I want to spend that three thousand dollars on Facebook and where that money is going to go. You know, if I'm talking to Thad at, at uh, you know, at, at Sunstoppers, they have a velocity, right, which is their own marketing uh, opportunity. Same thing, you know. People believe that they're marketers themselves. I think you and I have talked about this in the past and more than likely they're not. I certainly know that I was certainly no expert at it. Um, and, you know, utilizing somebody else's resource or, or ability, I think is, is smart. Yeah. And I'm not sure I'm even qualified to estimate a percentage, Eric, as to what percentage of either revenue or what other type of metric a, a, a dealer should allocate toward marketing. Um, I, I will say this, I think, you know, marketing certainly depends on the size of their market, you know, and their budget. Um, but on average, when I speak to dealers and you look at sort of the importance of a dealer's digital footprint, which includes their website and their social media presence and managing it and posting it and SEO and SEM, a lot of times dealers um, are, and, and maybe I'm really more jaded on the architectural side, are spending, you know, upwards of $5,000 a month. Um, and they see a return on it. Uh, I think automotive is a little bit different from what I've noticed. And Chris, uh, Eric, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But I notice a lot of the big shops tend to do tend to focus a lot on Instagram, you know, because a lot of what they're selling, especially tin or maybe color change uh, or is, is visual. So you need pictures about that uh, or paint protection film, which is not visual. You want a picture to show that it's not visual. And so. I see a lot of the big shops, some of, you know, many of the ones that you already named, Chris, that really have a very good and powerful Instagram presence. Um, and it's not just a question of, hey, taking a picture of a car that you did today and posting it. It's 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 getting as much mileage, pardon the pun, out of that picture, out of that car as you possibly can so that as many pr prospects see it as possible. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at a potential recession coming, um, if you are a dealer that does have the resources to continue to market, probably uh, history is said to continue to do so. Um, and that's certainly what we saw in 2008 with the housing crisis. Those that continue to market and especially those that really started to pursue the commercial marketplace were the ones that came out of that uh, ahead of the game. Those that didn't uh, either folded up their tents or they started working for someone else. And that's OK. Um, and so, you know, I think. It's going to be important if there is any kind of downturn, whether you're automotive or architectural, you want to get as much opportunity out of a single customer as you possibly can. So if that customer is coming in for paint protection film, you want to use that opportunity to cross sell and upsell 
or you want to make sure that customer knows you offer more than just pain protection film through an effective marketing strategy so that they go to you versus your competition across the street who does offer just as many products and services as you. Yeah, I'll lend one more little piece to this. First of all, fantastic answer, because you're definitely correct on all of that as far as I'm concerned. But <laughs> the one extra piece is that you're kind of like, you know, it's self-serving because the two of us are on this call. But like, you know, let's be honest with each other. Between whether you got Expo or 3M, you've got a recognized brand name within a consumer mindset, right? So I, I've always been disappointed in the idea that you've got these mega million or billion dollar companies where what they're suggesting is you need to market their name because they can't afford to do it for you or they're not going to do it for you, where 3M obviously does an incredible job with that, as does Expo. You know, so so if what you're doing is not only trying to create awareness of what you have to offer in terms of your installation quality, customer service, price points, et cetera, but you also have to convince the clients that you're talking to that the brand you're using is a is a decent brand worth worth putting on their vehicle or in their home, that's also part of the consideration, you know. And so I think that 3M and Expo have definitely got the upper hand in that regard. And then obviously SunTech and Luma are right in behind that. Um, you know, and then you look at other brands where where they're doing is they're they're spending a fortune on something like you know IWFC to try and convince shops that 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 that, that, that there's something bigger than they really are or that they're that that's the sexiness of the brand. It's not. The sexiness is to the consumer. The sexiness is let me generate a customer coming to your door and saying, hey, that's the brand I'm after. Thank you so very much. Now tell me why I'm dealing with you for the installation of that versus, okay, not only do I want you to tell me about the installation, but I've never even heard of that. What is that? I actually was hoping that you were using this brand instead. <clears throat> Clear. Um, let's talk about the topic that we've talked about many times before, I'll try and package it in a way that hopefully we can get what we're looking out of it. If not, we'll do another one, we'll bring it up again. Um, one, <laughs> one brand, the like expel all in versus, yeah. Hey, carry what you consider the best solution for your customer. So just to kind of give it some backstory. Sure. The way I understand the side, the, the perspective of, of some of, the maybe people in the comments is, sure. is they, they see it as their responsibility to, and I, I don't mean like, I'm not trying, this is the way I understand their, they feel like their responsibility to their customer is to select the best products according to their opinion in each category and offer that to their customer. Um, and the way, and then I'll just leave it to the way you see it. So that seems to be the side. And then like kind of this angle that maybe um, what Expel is doing is strong arming you into carrying all their products instead of just the best ones. Sure. Um, that's, that's what we're trying to tackle here, I suppose, is it's kind of like that two sides of the coin, right? There's going to be um, store owned manufacturers are going to be ones that don't own stores. There's going to be one that say you have to carry our exclusive products. There's going to be ones you don't, um, to the sure. point of strong arming. Do you feel any of your intent or expels intent is a strong arm move or is it simply a branding? Is it a, where do you see it? I'll leave it to you. So yeah, I'll definitely answer that. Number one, I, I'll tell you why I categorically feel it's not strong arming because you don't have to say yes. I don't sit there and tell you, I, as a matter of fact, let me be much more clear about this. I now oversee all of North America as, a, as, as my current responsibility. And I look at my reps and I talk to the reps and I ask them, by the way, how often are you on the road stopping at stores that have never even approached us? And the answer across all of them is never. It's so rare. It's insane. I mean, out of every hundred opportunities, not even one is one where we approach them. So you have thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming to us every single year in North America saying, please let me represent Expel. And I say, oh, well, first of all, thank you for reaching out because I am flattered by that. I do have some questions for you. And there's some come like qualifying questions. A lot of it has to do with where are you physically located? Do you have a brick and mortar? 
who are you currently using what are you currently spending in total dollars and like do you have certifications in these categories such as window film ppf flat glass or uh coating installation and you know let's talk about that number one when they come back with the answers we have this like short survey it's nine questions we then look at the answers to the questions and we determine number one the first thing we look at is is this shop too close to another expel exclusive shop right and that is a very key distinction uh if it's already a block down the road from an expel exclusive shop and that expel exclusive shop is in a territory where a, a geographical location where they're doing a very nice size of volume in comparison to their population density the answer is dress right away no we just literally send back an email saying, thank you so very much for reaching out. However, due to your answers, we've determined that you're too close to an existing operation that we don't want to bring you on board because of that. It's nothing personal. I mean, obviously, like, like Manny said, as a manufacturer, we want to sell more product. But what we don't want to do is cannibalize the sales of our existing clientele. Now, that's a difficult thing to still get into because some clients will still come back and go, well, hey, there's a guy only five minutes down the road for me. And then I have to go and look into it and I go, well, hold on a second. You told me you're exclusive. Actually, I just dealt with this one just yesterday. Yesterday. A great shop who's been with us for a long time. And I want to say his name, but I met him at the Barrett Jackson in person in uh, West Palm Beach. And, and he's a super passionate individual, been with us since before we even started producing film. And feels that he's exclusive. And feels that by bringing on another opportunity in the area, we, we did him dirty. And I'm like, bro, like, I don't understand. You say you're exclusive, but I'm looking at your website and you've got another brand of coding. Well, yeah, but that's because I came on before you had coding. You're right. So that's considered a grandfather account. You do not have to make the conversion over to expel now at this point we will not allow you to install another coating on top of our film for that we will void the warranty we've made that very clear however if you wish to remain grandfathered you're more than welcome no strong arming please stay the way you are be a brand that's expel and uh another coating brand i hope i didn't say the coating brand earlier because I try to stay away from brand names, unless it's 3M, because of course I want to pick on Manny as much as possible. So, you know, he's convinced in his brain that he's, ex that he's married to me, that he's exclusive with me. And I'm like, man, I don't even understand how you can use those words when you're using a, a top level coding brand against me. You're not exclusive, you're not married, you're dating, you're treating me like a vendor and I'm treating you like a client and we have a very good relationship that's reciprocal, but it's not a marriage. And so if what you're looking to do is stop the bleeding and not have more shops come into the area that are also going to become expel shops, it's your call. But I'm not making the decision for you. I need you to make the decision. You know, I won't say his name either because there's going to be a big announcement from a really big client in Ohio that is dropping their coding brand. Uh, he gave me the commitment just yesterday. Um, it's going to be an eye opener for a lot of people. But that's the reason he reached out. He was like, look, like I'm in this area. There's now two other people in this area. The population actually serves a much bigger city. But Chris, like, what are you doing to me? And I'm like, man, like we've talked about this many times before. It's been, it's on the record for two years now of conversations you've declined. And I understand why you declined it. You don't want to switch from your coding brand. I get it. It's all good. Don't. It's actually been better for me that you didn't. Like, candidly speaking, it's been financially better for me because it allowed me to operate, to open those two other shops in your physical area and bring on a lot more volume than just your coating would. Like, let's be very clear, guys. You want the secret? The secret is I'd rather that nobody said yes to going all in expel if they're a grandfathered account. Because financially I win. But the fact is I actually would much rather be honorable and give you the first right of refusal and sometimes second and third and fourth and fifth like we did with this gentleman and finally, it made sense to him. He goes, Chris, that's it. I, I don't want to, I, I recognize where Expel is going. That's my bread and butter. My Expel business is growing much faster than my coding businesses. And I'm thinking it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue that way. And I need to focus on that, not the coding. 
I do like your coating a lot. I don't like it as much as my current, but I'm sure I'll get to love it just like everything else. Switch the product out. You learn to love it, right? I mean, the reality is a lot of these guys love the current coatings or current tint or current PPF that they're currently using because that's what they're used to. But, you know, if you want a new account from me, I didn't approach you. You came to me. You want it. It's not a secret. You got to be XPL and you got to be XPL exclusive. If that doesn't suit you, I I'm cool with it. Please. Like, please. But I'll tell you that if you were 3M, I'd still be telling you you're a dumbass for not being exclusive with 3M. If you're SunTech, you're a dumbass for not being exclusive with SunTech. You know, Manny is aware of customers of his that are not using him exclusively. I'm aware of the customers that are not using me exclusively. Do you really think that they count as much as an exclusive count does, no matter how much we like them on a personal level, <sighs> especially from a manufacturer's level? Of course not. You know, it's our, our tier pricing in the U.S. is not a secret. We announced it in 2018. It's a benefit that everybody can, can accomplish. The more you spend with us, the more likely you are to automatically qualify for a tier discount. Why wouldn't you want to put your eggs in one basket? And I was having this conversation with that same gentleman. He's like, I don't believe in putting all my eggs in one basket. Okay, well, that's a really, really, really old mentality. If it still works for you, cool. I don't think that that's smart currently. You don't walk into a Mercedes-Benz dealership and say, hey, these are really nice Benzes, but actually I'm here for a brand new BMW. They're not selling you a new BMW. They're saying, hey, BMW is a great brand. Let me tell you why I think Mercedes-Benz is better. But at the end of the day, you're stuck on the BMW, then go down the road and grab the BMW. No problem. We get it. And, you know, I, I go back to 3M. I think 3M is an incredible brand. I've admired them for years. My own business partner back in the day was a, a very serious 3M, 3M buyer. And, and 3M treated us great. They were great people. You know, and so again, like if I'm a shop, I think that when a customer comes in and I have 3M on the wall and SunTech on the wall and Expel on the wall and I go, well, Eric, for you, I think that Expel is going to be the greatest fit. There's no way you trust me right now. You're looking at 3M's on the wall and Expel's on the wall and SunTech's on the wall. And yet for some reason, I locked on to Expel for you. But the next guy that comes in, I'm going to say 3M's the best. The next guy that comes in, SunTech's the best. Bullshit. It's because I have too much product of 3M in my, on, my shore, on my shelves. Or I got a special deal from Expel on a year-end clear out. Or SunTech's giving me a spiff. And that's why I'm trying to unload that film on that car. Just go do the best buy experience. If nothing else will highlight for you a lack of trust with multi-branding, it'll be that. But strong arm? No. You don't want it? Don't take it. I don't care. I really don't. I, I want your business. If you're a good fit for us and we're a good fit for you, of course I want your business. My job is to grow Expel, not shrink it. And, I, and it's really obvious. And, and Manny, I think, would say this himself. The growth that Expel has seen has been a culmination of this business model. This has been the most impactful thing that Expel has ever seen in its history. It is the B2B strategy, not only for North America now, but for the entire world. Are we doing it all today, right now, in the rest of the world? We are not. We need to pick our battles and understand where and when that timing is right to then start having those conversations. But I'll tell you the thing that pisses people off more than anything. When I set up a store directly beside them, and yet when they carry my competitor inside their store and they're pitching it to my client that showed up on my marketing dollars looking for Expel and they got another brand in there and they're pissed off at me for opening up a shop down the block, yeah, fuck you. That's bullshit. Plain and simple. Now I'll let Manny weigh in if you would like to. Well, uh, th there's definitely a lot to unpack there. Um, I certainly see the dealer's um, resistance to being dictated to, or as they call it, strong-armed, right? I mean, they're independent business people. They want to run their business as they see fit. They don't want any manufacturer coming in to um, d tell them how to run their business. Um, and I guess I would agree with Chris in the sense that it's not strong-armed because you can say no, right? Expel may not be the best fit for you if that's their business model. 
But if you do believe in the expel value proposition, then you have to play by expels rules because it's their value proposition. And it must be working to Chris's point, because just look at their quarterly earnings or filings and their annual reports, right? You can, you can see the numbers just increase from quarter to quarter or year over year. Now, having said that, um, you know, when I could answer this question in a self-serving manner by jumping all over the opportunity and saying, how dare Chris and so on and so forth, um, but that. I'll answer it in an honest way. I mean, the reality is uh, Chris or anybody in his position for any manufacturer is tasked with growing it. And uh, it is about numbers. And right now, um, Chris's model or Expel's model seems to be working where it does increase the um, it, it does increase earnings. And if uh, out of a hundred people that they interview or qualify, if ninety nine of those hundred are coming to Expel wanting to get on the bandwagon, then guess what? If you say no, there's somebody waiting in the wings who will say yes. Now, having said that, 3M's model is different as are other manufacturers' models, right? Um, you know, we would love to have exclusive partners all over the country. Absolutely. Who wouldn't? Um, but it isn't 3M's policy to do that. It isn't other manufacturers' policy to do that. And there could be a number of reasons why it's not their policy to do that. Um, and the installer or the dealer that says, you know, I want to offer this ceramic coating because it's better than Expels, and I want to offer this PPF because it's better than 3Ms, and it's ultimately what I feel is the best for my client, I get that too, right? Because the client's coming in, they're relying on the dealer's professional opinion to make recommendations, and uh, the dealer honestly feels that brand A is better for this and brand B is better for that, and the dealer assumes that by offering the client the best product and service, that makes the client happy. There are no callbacks. The client has positive word of mouth and the dealer's business grows. You know, that's the other that's the other business model at play here. It's just as 180 degree different from Expel. And I think every dealer's got to make their uh, make their own personal decision is what's right from them. You can jump on the Expel bandwagon, uh, follow their rules of engagement. Maybe you lose a little bit of control for your business uh, or within your business, but that can positively impact your business or you could have a 180 degree different business model where, where other with, with that other manufacturers have and embrace that. And you can grow your business just the same with that business model. So I think it's a personal preference. And if you don't like one model, go to the other, because there are plenty of models out there because there are plenty of manufacturers out there offering very similar films and finishes. And this is, this is true even on the architectural side as well. Right. I mean, and I think it's a little bit harder on the architectural side because um, not everybody makes a, you know, a purple polka dot film. And that one time some customer needs a purple polka dot film, you're going to have to get it from wherever you want. Right. And I think even Expel acknowledges that, Chris, if I'm not mistaken, that if you don't make something, you certainly understand the dealers need to go out and source it elsewhere. And so yeah. I think everyone's just got to make the best decision for their business and, and, and every business is different. So every decision will be different. So I'm going to add a little bit more to it. I would have a lot more respect for the vast majority of the shops that give me that answer if they actually had a single brand as their offerings within a specific department. Like if they had a single brand of coding or a single brand of PPF or a single brand of tint that they're currently using, where I lose all respect or credibility for them is when they've got multiple brands that are literally competing against themselves within the shop and then are saying, well, I want the customer to make the call. Because I'll go back and say, well, if that's the case, then are you also letting the customer dictate how you install the film or the coating? What do you mean? Well, let's imagine the customer came in and said, well, what I want you to do is shrink the back glass first, but don't install it. Then I want you to come over to the driver's side. I want you to install that next. And then what I want you to do is just put a windshield visor in. Oh, and go back to the back. No, of course you wouldn't let them do that. Why? It's because you're the expert. You're supposed to be the expert. You're supposed to be the one literally informing them of, of, of the best decision that you can make on their behalf because genuinely speaking they don't know the business the way you do so again you know when i when i hear somebody and, I, and i'm looking at that survey response and they've got three brands of coding all of which are competitive with one another i'm like man like don't tell me that it's because you're you know you believe that 
you're picking the best product for the customer. You're pick, picking it either on price point, or you're picking on installation ability, or you're picking it on some other context that has got nothing to do with whether or not it's actually the best. The other part, of course, is that people will say, well, how do I get around the fact that I've been telling brand, everybody brand X has been the best for all these years? I'm like, come on, are you serious? I mean, constantly there's development, constantly there's change. Look, 3M brought out a coding not that long ago, and I'm sure it's an amazing coding. I haven't been able to convince Manny yet to send me some to test because I'm sure he'd like obviously get, you know, uh, uh, not not to get a response from 3M if we're doing so. <laughs> but the, the, I'm just teasing him, of course. But I mean, the reality is that again, like 3M drop brought out a coding. Do you think it's shit? Of course not. It's 3M. They're going to bring in an amazing product. Well, they weren't in the market before. Is it possible that that 3M coding is better than everything else in the market? It's definitely a possibility. And if it is, are you telling me you can't honestly have a great conversation with your client and say, look, I know I told you in the past that brand X was the best. That was true in, uh, up until now. But now I've decided to go with this instead. And here's my reasons why. And you, and you, and you answer to that. You know, in x case, we're not shy about the fact that you can put another coating on the film. And if you do so, you're going to avoid the warranty. Like there is so much problems happening right now with coating and film. It's insane. And it's not just our company that's seeing this. It's everybody. So by us being very cognizant of that, you know, if you're trying to install paint protection film from us, but then you're trying to put another coating on top of it that's going to screw the customer's warranty and we're being complicit and allowing you, well, now we're equally liable. We're not willing to have that happen. So there's other factors behind why that may still be a better choice. I, I don't pretend that Expel is the best at everything. As a matter of fact, I will gladly tell anybody that's on this right now, 3M is kicks our ass on flat glass. They're the dominant players. My friend Manny crushes me on the east coast we're not even comparable in sales of flat glass to each other but the fact is that if you're asking me if i have let's say the the best total solution package for your business i feel the answer is yes but i don't want you to agree with that because i'm saying it i want you to decide that on your own and if you make that decision on your own and we're a good fit for each other then let's 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 move forward let's make it happen but other than that you don't want it please don't take it don't even reach out you said it earlier chris and i you know i think it's very valuable um nugget was where you said you know you went as far as to say if you're suntech i think you should be all in on suntech if you're lumar be all in lumar if you're 3m be all in on 3m i as somebody who carried a, a bazillion brands at one time i agree with you Totally. I would not want to carry multiple brands personally if I was to ever uh, find myself in a retail scenario, regardless of the brand. I think it makes your life tremendously easier. Not to say you can't run a business with multiple brands. You run a great business and tons of shops are doing it. I just, to your point, I don't think you're doing yourself a favor um, in the sales process, in the training process, in your inventory, in your displays, in your relationships. I, I just don't think you're doing yourself a favor. I on mean that wholeheartedly. I think at least in automotively, if you were to reach out, and I'm sorry, Manny, I, I don't mean, of course, to be comparing myself to 3M at this point, but I think that if you were to reach out automotively specifically and talk to any or all of the shops that went 100% exclusive with Expel, they would categorically be showing you how they far outpaced anyone in the same market that didn't take that opportunity. Far outpaced. Now, like Manny said, uh, there is truth to the idea that if we don't carry it, that's non-competitive, then with my blessing, go get it. You know, we don't carry a full line of decorative. 3M has a massive line of decorative. I don't care if you use 3M's decorative. I don't even care if you put 3M's logo on your website talking about their decorative films because of it. That's not a conflict of interest. Uh, you know, we don't carry vinyl. My favorite vinyl on the planet is 3M's 2080. If I was doing my own car, that's the only vinyl I'd put on it. And so you want to use 3M's vinyl? Hey, with my blessing, please go do it. Please go get it. But if you're going to tell me, well, the customers showed up and they want SunTech film, that's why I carried it all of a sudden. Now we got a problem. I'm like, no. That's like the Mercedes-Benz store somehow managing to offer a brand new BMW. It's not available. You want to offer another coating because the customer asked for it because that's the last one you use? The answer is no. You moved on. This is the new product. This is why you made the choice. This is why it's best for you, Mr. Customer. Make it happen. 
Well, one point I'd like to hit on, Chris, is that you mentioned um, a dealer potentially flipping a customer that was brought into their store on your marketing dollar. And there is no bigger crime, let's say, to a manufacturer than really a dealer taking a lead that came from a manufacturer and then flipping it over to another brand. And sometimes the dealer does it without knowing, and it's an honest mistake. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly if it's something that's done intentionally, that's ultimately going to cause conflict with your manufacturer. Uh, because, you know, while dealers do a wonderful job of marketing their businesses and bringing their own customer base into their stores, manufacturers do it too. And Expel is exceptional at it. And so uh, I could certainly understand where there would be some conflict if there's this perception that Expel's marketing resources are being spent to grow another manufacturer's product line. And while I can't speak for 3M because I don't work for 3M as a master distributor for 3M, I would have an issue with it if it was an EPD dollar spent and I found out that my that a dealer uh, flipped a customer over to Expel or Suntech that I was responsible for bringing to them in the first place, whether we're talking automotive or architecturally. And so I think I think everybody's just got to kind of put things into perspective in the sense that, you know, what, what are we ultimately talking about? One of the things is, well, I want to run my own business and I don't want somebody telling me what to do. That's 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 part one. And then part two is ultimately to say, well, independent of me losing a little bit of control over my business, do I believe in the Expel business model or the 3M business model or the Eastman business model and has to make their, their decision based on, you know, product, marketing, service, software, brand, and so on and so forth. And I don't think there's any secret that, uh, you, you know, the two most familiar brands to the uh, end user um, is our 3M and Expel, especially to the end user that does their research. They're going to come across both of those brands in their research. So, you know, manufacturers have to protect their brand as well. And I think that's some something that we, and I, I lump myself in there because I'm not a manufacturer, often forget that red 3M logo that, that we all know so well. I mean, the estimated worth of that is into the billions. And that is Billions. 3M's most prized possession. And when you form a relationship as a 3M dealer, you get the right to use it. That's what you sign your contract for with 3M. All that language is really about putting some, some guidelines around how you can use that logo because it's so important to 3M. And I suspect Expel has something very similar in place. So, you know. Yeah, but that 3M logo, like that 3M logo is as recognizable as Coca-Cola or Harley Davidson worldwide or IBM. Yeah. Yeah. Let's be yeah. very candid, right? There's no human being on this planet unless you're like, I don't even know. Like you'd have to be in like some Amazon forest where you haven't seen humanity <laughs> besides yourself, right? Where you don't have access to a television that doesn't know that logo, right? And like, if I'm 3M, you can be damn sure I'm going to be outrageously protective. Look, I know that EPD does an incredible job with their digital marketing and, and their campaigns. I wouldn't even feel comfortable if one of my clients was switching a customer over from there. I would feel like that's doing them dirty. Never mind, you know, never mind the fact that it actually gained something for me if that happens to result in some film sales. And it's because I am that passionate about what am I investing in your business or what is 3M investing in your business through their marketing channels for then you to go and use it on use it with somebody else. You know, let's let's not let's not leave a little bit out here. Let's be fair to 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 Ceramic Pro, right? I mean, in terms of the ceramic coating market, every one of us owes them a little bit of debt of gratitude because they really created the hype for it. Sure did. And that's another company where, at least in ceramic coating, you know, there's a lot of consumer awareness about that brand. You know, and and it doesn't matter whether or not you genuinely feel it's the best or not. I think it's an amazing product line. But, you know, you might be really like in love with your, let's say, some other awesome coatings like Fine Lab or G-Technic or C-Quartz or Gion, all awesome lineups. But are you genuinely going to try and tell me that they have any consumer awareness that, that Ceramic Pro has? Not even close. So, you know, it's how would Ceramic Pro feel if a Ceramic Pro client showed up to then get flipped into Expel Fusion or 3M's coating? not good about it even though we're great brands with some marketing awareness
Well said. Um, before we wrap this up. Um, oh. Well, I'm not saying we're wrapping it up. T time's going by quickly. I'm not saying we're wrapping it up. I'm just saying before I'll, we wrap I'll, it up. I'll stay on for two hours. I don't care. <laughs> well, we Manny can take told this me out. that Maria, Maria, told him, told, told, Maria told him that he could stay on as long as we wanted. <laughs> My, my wife texts me while my wife texts me while this is going on, and she knows I'm in the middle of a podcast. So I'm wondering if she's like trying to tell me that like one of the kids fell and and put her teeth through her lip like Brienne did yesterday oh, or God. something. Hopefully not. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. Um, so, speaking of Tanner battles, which uh, Manny expel supporting, and Manny will be on the. Uh, Tintwiz Tinter Trivia Team. Um, Tintwiz Team, yep, for Tinter Trivia. Tinter Trivia is one of three competitions that will lead into Tinter Battles to the main event. Manny will be one of five people representing Team Tintwiz. There's four teams in total, um, all Facebook groups, um, but we'll only talk about Team Tintwiz for this conversation. We can ignore the other three groups. They don't matter right now. Um, Manny, I sincerely appreciate you being on the team, Chris, the invitation is open, um, but maybe we could jump into this video. It'll be three minutes of everyone's time, and it'll show you a little bit more about what Tinter Trivia will be at Tinter Battles. Here we go. Mm. The first company to file a patent on paint protection film. Is there supposed to be audio? Mm. Mm. Interesting. Hold on, hold on. You don't hear audio? Hold on. Hold on. Uh, Manny, did you hear audio? Yes. I can't hear you. So that's Chris exclusive then. Yeah, Chris, can you hear me at all? Manny, are you able to hear him? Shake your head yes yeah. or no. You can. Something happened on my end then. Sorry, guys. We, and we can hear you. It's okay. I mean, we'll just wait because I want you to hear the video. I think it's a great question that uh, was being asked <laughs> oh, there, Eric. I, can't I hope hear we you get guys. the answer. Do you want to disconnect and reconnect? Like, cut out and then come back i don't know how to do that i don't know what he's saying i know it's making all these crazy chat? gestures at me but i've done something wrong i guess um huh that's, weird that's the next just, uh, are you texting me on the background okay great <laughs> what's worse is that you guys can hear me and i can't hear you See, for all of you that don't know, Chris has got some technical difficulties. All right, you signed out. Not okay. yet. Oh, we'll cool. do. Just the simple disconnect, reconnect is usually, it's like the restart. Can you hear us now, Chris? All right, no, now he's out. And uh, we'll be back. <coughs> How many people are listening, Eric? About 40. Wow. That's a great audience. Yeah. It's been um, 40 plus throughout. Definitely great audience. Comments are active. Um, are there any questions, here. Is there any questions for the for 3M while we're waiting on Chris? Or mo most seem like they were geared for Chris and Expel. I mean, Chris wanted to bring the heat and I feel like it Expel has like the heat kind of like people get a little fiery when they like, you know, depending on what side of the coin they're on, yeah, it uh, gets the gets everyone going a little bit. So. Well, you know, just while just while waiting on waiting for Chris, uh, I am excited to be part of the uh, Tint Whiz team. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Eric. And I'm looking forward to uh, I'm looking forward to Amelia Island. Well, and I'm looking forward to it as well. Um, let me just hold on one second. Just uh, there it is. Um, yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's great to have you on the team, um, and it's uh, I'm glad you're coming. I'm glad to see everybody that is coming. Um, it's less than 30 days away, 28 days yeah. away, and I am certain it will be a very unique experience that has never happened in this industry before. So there he is. 
Can you so hear us? Sorry, guys. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, Perfect. we can hear you. I apologize. I have no clue what happened. No worries. Now, the key is if I start this video, if you can still hear, if that was right, the issue, that could have been the issue. I don't know. Go ahead. All right, fingers yeah. crossed. Good shot. Mm. The first company to file a patent on paint protection film. Hmm. Interesting. First year security film was introduced to the market. Seriously, why isn't this information uh, more talked about? <laughs> Maybe it's because up until now, it's been sounding like this. First traces of render film dates back to when I was 13, which puts it precisely at, uh, uh, it puts it at 3000 BC. And it was tracing back to the uh, meso, meso, mesophilioma, uh, no, uh, Mesopotamia. It dates back to Mesopotamian days. And uh, anybody's got a, a question, question, uh, I, what? What? Mesopotamia? Mesopotamia? <sighs> More like what a mess. I think we all agree this needs a revamp and a splash of entertainment. So I've got an idea. What if we make information fun? Like turning it into a contest. Hmm. We're gonna need about four teams. I got it. Four Facebook groups. Window Film Pros. Window Tinters United, Tint West Community, and Tint Entertainment. Now, each one of them can have five participants per team, and we can set it up like a trivia with topics based on the history and terminology of Tint and PPF. Yes! Here's the setup. We have a total of three rounds, Team A versus Team B, for a total of 10 questions. The first team to get the most questions right advances. And then round two can be Team C versus Team D for a total of 10 questions. The team that gets the most answers right also advances. Now for the third one, the third and final round, it should be 20 questions. And the team that gets the most questions right will win the contest declaring the winner and most intelligent group on Facebook. I like that idea. It's a great interactive way to learn with entertainment fun. For you, for me, for everyone. Hmm, interesting. I like that. I wonder what else is out there. Hmm? Did you know that the first window tinted vehicle showed up between 1940 and 1958, and it was the innovation of Easy Eye Factory Tint? Now, initially, window tinting was only available through auto manufacturers. DIYers wires eventually got into the game and started experimenting with a few different methods, including a spray-on tint, but it didn't look very good. It didn't last very long. It was prone to streaking and the visibility was terrible. So then a company finally figured out a way to dye a window film. You wanna know what that company was? Join us for Tinter Trivia Game Show at Tinter Battles 2023, live in Omnia Resort, Amelia Island, Florida, on January 5th through the 8th. Squeegee that. <laughs>
unlike anything else, um, it's, it's of its kind. It'll be starting with a Thursday night welcome reception, uh, food and drinks. And then, you know, Friday from before breakfast, there's Tinder active activities um, led by others in the community all the way through breakfast. Um, you know, the competitions throughout the day, lunch, dinner, and all that goes into dinner. And the next day will be um, speaking and educational events. There's obviously training both days. Um, and then the, the big, you know, event that uh, Saturday will be the main dinner battles, followed by a reception dinner, a send off Sunday morning breakfast, and you're starting your year off um, in a tinterific way on January, ending January 8th, Sunday. So anyway, Amelia Island, Florida. That's the plan. Looking forward. That's the plan. 28 days away. Still spots on away. this community uh, Tinter trivia team, if any, anybody's interested. Well, you don't want me on that team because I don't think I – I mean, the reality is I think I would just answer 3M to most of those questions. Who invented this? 3M. Who invented that? 3M. <laughs> Who invented God? 3M. Like... <laughs> <laughs> that is the vibe that is the vibe the promo gave was 3 I, I, I feel like we're doing a 3m like spotlight here yay hey it's good for 3m it's good for me i'll take it yeah uh, listen now now i'm just gonna feel like even more deflated than normal when i'm on this thing with you oh stop we'll launch a tint investigation into uh, those accusations. <laughs> <laughs> now are we are we talking window film conference? Because I feel like now we're getting on that track. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Investigations. Let's just, let's just yeah, that's where I'm going with it. We'll we'll leave it alone. <clears throat> so yes, tinner battle season um, coming up. Any other questions? Anything you wanted to touch on that maybe um, I missed from the comments? Um, or weren't in the comments. Um, I, I'm not reading the, the comments. I'm not sure if yeah, you're asking. I'm not I mean, asking like, somebody else. anything you'd want to address that you kind of um, word on the streets. We didn't cover it, and you feel like it could be beneficial. We could. We, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I have a word on the here. street is that is that if I go to Tinter battles, right, which is what a lot of people have been asking, that Manny and I are going to have a jujitsu match. Oh God, that's no word, that's that's word on the street. <laughs> so. If you're agreeing to this, there could be mats there, and um, it definitely fits into the Tinter Active um, session. I'm sure a lot of people would love to roll around with the. One oh yeah, the I want to. I want to go head to head with the number one rated, number one rated fighter in the world. Okay, no thanks. <laughs> So, but I mean, like, I feel like that would be the same as me going head to head with him on on trivia. Like, there's no way that I would hold a fucking candle to him. So, as a matter of fact, I don't even know if any other team should bother competing if he's on. Oh, uh, see now, now I think Chris is setting me up for failure, Eric. Because now I'll no, probably go no, no, question. no. Well, don't get <laughs> well, too. The nervous. way I understand, the way I understand it is, and and I could be wrong, but the way I understand it is, like, Manny will go against another person from the team, but then like another oh. teammate goes against another person. So he can't carry the whole team. Oh, mm. wow. Okay. That's my you understanding. Know, One person it, can't carry the, the whole team. Carlos will come up with some way of making this much more interesting than normal. I guarantee it. And I know there's official buzzers, like the buzzers are like commercial quality buzzers. So it's going to be like, you're wow. pressing the buzzer. It reads on a main buzzer and it's like, you know, not a raise. Oh, yeah. I'm that gonna have cool. to tell. Uh, I got Alex Valencia, Billy Ellis, and Tim Ham going down to represent Expel on the PPF training. I'm gonna have to tell them. Listen, here's what I really need you to do. I need you to kidnap Manny from the <laughs> event, right, so that he doesn't have an opportunity to answer those questions. Because for sure, I'm convinced that my dear friend is gonna outshine anybody else on those panels. I think he's maybe. Up for well, maybe. Eric. Well, well hold on. I'll tell you this. I think that if I could get Harry to go, he could, he might be the one person that could give you. And I'm sure EPD. I'm sorry, Eastman's got a number of people on their team that might might obviously give some people like Manny a good run for their money. I think I could. I listen. Let me talk to Harry and see if he's going. We need to see if he's. Well, for, for the record, I want it known. I am no master of tint trivia, but I am excited to be. I, I was honored, Eric, that you asked me to join your team. So I, I'm looking very much forward to it. Now let's I'm going to be a nervous wreck because of what Chris said. He's psyching well, me let's out. Put this out see? there. No, no, no. Yeah. Let's let me be clear about this. Do you know the first time I heard about this was right now? What does that mean? It means that my dear friend Eric <laughs> asked my dear friend Manny, which you're now alluding to. 
that he asked you to join the team. Clearly, he didn't even think to ask me. He wasn't even like, hey, I need to get Chris on my team. He was smart enough to realize that that was a recipe for disaster. Here's the thing. It's two sides. So um, personality-wise, I wouldn't want to put any pressure on you to, to be on. You know, I wouldn't want you to feel like <laughs> obligated. Now. This is how I am. But beyond that, I also have an eye for trivia, right? Like trivia, like trivia type, like knowledge. I just feel like Manny being, you know, grown up in this. It's like that stuff's embedded in him. Like probably an arm bar is for you or like, you know, it's like, just, listen, right? I still think it's also well, because you know that the answer to 99% of those questions, if especially if we're talking about who invented it, it's 3M. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, I don't know what type of questions are going to be, but it's, it sounds like Carlos has put together like historical questions, not like current, like mm -hmm. active questions. So it's like a history of type of thing is the, the so anyway, that's the only reason team still wide open. Um, we have Cody Becker on the team, um, which is, oh, Cody, you know, Cody Becker, yeah, know amazing flat sure. dealer out of Delaware. And, yeah. um, and we have Manny. And then we'll see whatever happens from there. I'm over. What about there. Rob? Rob's a tough one because Rob likes skiing. And I suppose it snows a lot right around that time. Oh. Which Rob now, are we I, talking about? Oranges. Uh, Manny's cohort in um, yeah. live podcasting and um, – Rob Oranges, yeah. My oh, partner in crime on our Window Film Revolution podcast, which Got it. which Rob is very, very proficient in all things window film, including trivia. So he's probably the one to watch out for if if he ends up coming. Yeah. I feel like like when they hit you with the U value question, oh, that's yeah. like he's like, probably got every U or Rob, like it's like what committed. He's value? probably got the U value of every film committed in his brain on any kind of glass. Yeah. Well, Including we'll the competitive what... film? Oh, yeah. Wow. So, I mean, that's how Harry is, too, in fairness. Like, yeah. he really yeah. knows Harry the competitive well. product unbelievably well. Now, again, I don't have the experience of sitting beside Rob and knowing the same context that you do, but I do admit that Harry, I mean, there's a reason why he utilizes him so much for answering flat class stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Harry would do very well for sure. And I think, um, you, you know, I don't know much about the history. Um, and I, I'm more, you know, I guess my strength is more about knowing we're trying to pursue opportunities that are in front of us that we sort of already talked about earlier in the, in the podcast. But Rob is very, very fluent and proficient in all things technical as it relates to window film, auto and flat. Interesting. So if it's any consolation, Chris, I'm actually not on my own team either. So I left myself <laughs> off the team because I don't feel like I'm a strong, like trivia person. Now, sure. it's, it's, it's 50% that I really don't, I don't, it's just like, I know what I know, but I don't know that I'm going to be as strong in the trivia department. Um, the sure. other thing that I feel like was an opportunity here is, and this has nothing to do with like, who's on like, well, it does have something to do with who's on the team, but not don't read too deep into it. But I feel like, you know, with, I saw this as an opportunity, not for me to try and prove my trivia knowledge, but as an opportunity to let other people um, be highlighted, be seen, their knowledge be shown. Because someone sure. like Manny, for example, is somebody like Manny does um, podcast with Rob Oranges in Window Film Revolution Group. And like, I just think they're tremendously awesome. I think they're contained being just in that group. I don't think enough people see them. I don't think people get to see them later on. They should be on YouTube. They should be searchable because the amount of knowledge you have and are willing to put out there um, is, is so awesome. And then there's so there's other people like you in the industry. And I want people like um, people like everyone, people in the industry to be able to put a name with a face be comfortable because they met you in person at Tanner Battles and it wasn't just through the internet and reach out to you when they have a question or an opportunity or something. And, um, you know, I just think there's so many people that are out there that are kind of known in the peripheral online, but like not well enough. And this sure. is an opportunity to let people shine, you know? Well, makes sense. Well, looking forward to it. And th thank you, Eric, for the compliment. Rob and I enjoy those podcasts and, and uh, we, we probably should do more. And I think you're right. I mean, I don't know how many people listen to it live or go back and listen to it when it's the link's been posted. But hopefully there, there are people that enjoy it and, um, you, you know, uh, they ask great questions. It's and a big group. 
Yeah, that's a very active and interactive group. So I suspect that, I mean, there's, there's no way that, that, that those podcasts aren't being obviously paid attention to. But to your point, Eric, it would be better still if it was on some more open forums beyond that, such as YouTube, so that people can, you know, can find them and relate to them afterwards. Here's the thing. In a Facebook group, like, and I mean, and I know, Chris, you're not like an enormous Facebook guy, but if you've ever done this or Manny, if you've ever done this, have you ever searched a Facebook group for content for something you were looking for, whether it be like, Hey, mm-hmm. I know so-and-so posted a, a thing or like, it's the worst experience ever. Like if I was like, I want to find all Manny's podcasts and just like maybe binge watch them today or listen, cause I'm working. It's basically impossible. You have to leave your phone open the entire time. Um, because if you even touch it, it's going to go right off the video. So I just think like contained inside a group is just not giving it justice. Um, yeah. Yeah, especially when you have an option like putting the audio on Spotify or whatnot, people listen to it while they work or Apple, I, like Apple podcasts. It, it is really like untapped, not untapped, but like a lot of people actually listen to stuff like that there. Um, whereas like Facebook, it's like it came, it went and it's, it's gone. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, Chris, I'm taking this as you're coming to Tinner Battles and I'll have jujitsu mats uh, Perfect. ready in the room for you. <laughs> I, I may be pay, I may be making a guest appearance. All right. Well, that sounds, that's all I'll, I'll say for now. I'll take that. Um, and we'll, we'll really figure out if there should be mats there or not. For real, though. Like, if you think that would be a good, um, fun exercise. Because I know, like... Listen, there's, at, a like, lot, there's a lot of window film installers in our community and, and uh, uh, that, that do jujitsu. I mean, a lot. It always shocks me that every time XDC comes up, a lot of my clients are reaching out and saying, hey, are we going to go to jiu-jitsu while we're at XDC? And I'm like, fuck yeah, let's line it up. Last year, I think we had uh, like 13 or 14 of us that went to, to, to a dojo and, and did a lesson. It was awesome. So you never know. Maybe somebody does there. want to challenge me for some time on the mats while we're there. I could use, right. a, I could use a warm-up before, before Pan Ams. Friday morning. 7 a.m., 7.30, Tinner Active. Start the day off right. Before <laughs> breakfast. Just throwing it out there. Just throw um, it out there. Did we, did we miss any, uh, any uh, hard questions? Uh, we got Scott asking what belt you are. Black belt. I got my black belt after 13 years this past December. Um, in fairness to Scott, I, I actually was hoping that I wouldn't for another year or so. I had just made it to the number one position in brown belt um, in the world for both gi and no gi at master four in both my weight category and open weight category for both those, um, for again, both gi and no gi. So I was really proud of that. But at the end of the day, there were some tournaments that I really wanted to, to still partake in that I hadn't, such as Europeans and Brazilian nationals. Those were two that I haven't, uh, haven't had a chance to, to go to and compete at. So I was, hoping to do that at Brown because my likelihood of winning at Brown was obviously very high. The negative with getting to black belt is that all black belts are black belts. So most of the guys I'm competing with, actually matter of fact, all the guys I'm competing with are between the ages of 51 and 56 years old in my category now, which is called master five, which means that most of them have had their black belt a minimum of 30 years versus a guy that just got it not even a year ago. I can tell you all right now that a person who's had their black belt for six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years versus a person that just got it might as well be a white belt compared to a black belt on a regular mats. Uh, it's very dramatic in terms of their skill set difference and the amount that they have available to them and knowledge and pressure and strength and all this stuff. You know, I was um, most happy, believe it or not, with just winning my very first black belt match. My first black belt match came up against a guy who's been a Judoko black belt for, I think, around 20 years. He owns his own academy. Um, Eric is his name. Super nice guy. And he's been a jujitsu black belt for three years. And, and I played a strategy that he wasn't expecting because he watched a lot of tape on me. And, and thankfully, you know, by luck or by a little bit of skill, I managed to pull it off and win my first fight. But uh, overall, I'm losing more fights than I'm winning at black belt now because of the gross disparity and the skill difference. So... Getting back to the question, which was a very long answer. Now a black belt, proud to be a black belt, proud to be a professor. But uh, learning curve is starting all over again at this level. Did you work out today? No, today I didn't so that we could do our podcast. Yesterday? Yes. 
So it's like an everyday hours, thing, almost every day. Two hours thing. on the mats. Yeah, almost every day. Uh, in fairness, the last two months with the new role, right? Um, the director of sales role has has definitely, and I and I and I haven't been able to either find or promote from within yet to to go down to the RSM roles, which are now vacant because Eric Cummins and I both went up to a director level, as did of course Zach Burke. So that's left uh, 30 some odd direct reports, which has meant that my time is, uh, you know, a little less available for training than normal, but jujitsu is a big part of my life as is my wife and my two kids. So finding that balance has not been easy. So there's been less training than normal, but uh, I uh, finally got the go ahead to uh, put the headcount request out for the RSMs. We should see those two jobs posting on Monday. And I've got to do one for Canada as well, put those uh, next level management in play and then should be able to get myself right back to the schedule because my plan for next year is 12 to 14 tournaments and to uh, try very hard to end up in number one position again. It's awesome. every four weeks. Once About. every four weeks. Yeah. It t last, last, when I went to number one at Brown, it was with 14 competitions in 12 months. Correct. Yeah. I, I admire the work-life balance or whatever, you know, like however you pull that off. Cause like, it's still like, it comes to my mind. Some like today it came to my mind. I went to the gym and it came to my mind. I'm like, Chris Hardy's probably working out at least two hours today and he's busy as fuck too. So like, what is it? Like you have to, you have to carve away the time, but the days can get away so quickly and so easily. Yeah. And, and I need it. Like, you know, Manny and myself and yourself with the work ethic that we all have, you and I both, well, we all know that, that there's obviously a lot of like external stress from work that, that culminates from that. So I need that outlet. I need that release. I, I actually can see it in myself, much like you see people that get hangry. I don't get hangry. I mean, I do weight cuts and they're pretty extreme, but I do get uh, testy, if you will, if I haven't trained for a little while and, and you know, that's building up. So it's smarter to, 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 for me to train than not. Let's just put it that way. Manny, how's your work-life balance briefly? Not bad or does work really get you? Like, you know, I, I, I guess if you ask my wife, Maria, she'd have a different answer. I think it's pretty healthy, but I do enjoy work. And I think, you know, hopefully the passion comes through. It certainly comes through with, with you, Eric, and with you, Chris. I have the same passion. And I've, I've talked about this in the past. That this is a very strange industry that um, if you're not in it, you probably, I don't want to say you look down upon it, but you can't figure out how people make money in it. You can't figure out why people are in it. But once you are in it, it sucks you into the point where you never want to leave it. And you have a, such a deep passion for the industry, for the products, for the solutions, for uh, the different manufacturers, for the different dealers to the point where, um, you know, a lot of times it doesn't even seem like work. So I might be working quite a bit, but it doesn't really seem like work to me. And, and Maria will complain and say, Hey, you're doing a podcast. You're not spending any time with me. Um, or, Hey, why are you working or whatever the case might be, but she is looking forward to coming to with me to Amelia Island. So it does have its trade-offs. Oh, wow. Well now let me just say officially, there's one, no way I'm not making it just there so you go. hang out with Maria. There you go. She'd be happy. Thank you, Chris. That'll make her day right. because you know, <laughs> Um, we, I, I was telling, I was telling Eric earlier in the day that I just booked all my arrangements and we're ready to come down. And, uh, um, I typically don't like to, um, you know, Florida is not part of our distribution territory. So I typically, when I travel, it's just for work and it's in our distribution territory. So I'm, we're looking forward to going to a nice warm state. Yeah. It's stunning. It's not too much warmth. It is January, but mm -hmm. it is going to be a, a nice state. And yeah. much <laughs> nicer than Maryland. Warmer for sure. Warmer, right? correct. Yes. Warmer for sure. Yeah. yeah. And and look, that's another, I think, um, reason why this event shines is because it really is one you could bring your family to. Um, they'll probably enjoy themselves considering the amenities and so on, even if they want nothing to do with the competitions and so on. Like it's a beautiful resort. And I do think like, you know, mixing family and work can can be a good thing sometimes, you know, like um being able to do some work, then be involved a little bit, see what, what you do and who you do it with. It can be, you know, I don't know. It's better than going to Indianapolis. It's Florida. So anyway. <laughs> Fair. Um, it's funny you say that. I'm heading there on Friday. <laughs> are you? 
Yeah, no offense to any of the Indianapolis, Indianapolis first, but then Sunday is Scottsdale. So, you know, quid pro quo. Beautiful. Well, good travels, safe travels. And yeah. um, thanks for the time. I, I can't put into words the appreciation I have that both of you are always so candid and open and, and share your time hours at in the night um, to come on here and uh, and and talk. I think it's tremendously value and I, valuable and for everyone. And I really, really just want to thank you both. Um, and just, you know, express my appreciation. You guys consistently do it. And um, there's never a lack of candidness, which I think is important. You know, you're just willing to put it out there open and honestly. And that's what all it is, right? It's fun. And I, and I appreciate the uh, invitation, Eric. And I, I thank Chris for the initial introduction. We, we, this is the second time we've done a podcast together with you. And it is fun. It's, you, you know, to the point that I was just making earlier, it doesn't even seem like work even though it's, you know, quarter to 10 here. Um, and anytime you extend an invitation to me, I'd be happy to be on it, Eric. Thank you so much. Yeah, just make sure I'm not on with him again, okay? <laughs> I think it's good when we're on especially together. If he's, especially yeah. if he's going to have that stunning EPD logo in the background and I'm going to have like a louvered cover, a shade covering on my window. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously, Eric, I, I figured it out two minutes before we went live. <laughs> so, oh, we'll see. Now you're making me even look worse because I couldn't figure it out while we were on the call. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for the invitation. And obviously, thank you so very much for what you're doing for the community. I think that this podcast is amazing. Uh, wow, there we go. See? So it's no EPD background. No. Uh, but I, I, you know, first of all, of course, love being on with Manny. Manny and I are really good friends. We're diehard competitors against each other through the day. But when the day is over, you know, we've had a, a friendship for quite a, a long time. And I'm very proud to say that. And I'm proud to say that I'm friends with quite a few people from Eastman as well for the same exact reason. You know, a lot of mutual respect within that company as well. So, you know, what you're doing for this community in general is incredible. And I think, you you know, these podcasts are completely invaluable uh, to, to anybody and everybody that's listening. So thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're here. All right. Well, um, obviously, thank you to everyone who listens because there'd be no point of doing it necessarily if nobody listens. So thanks to everybody, obviously, out there as well. And uh, we'll wrap it up. Have a good night, everyone. Have a good night. Have a great night. Happy holidays. Happy oh, holidays. Oh, happy holidays. Well done. See, Take talk care, to everyone. me again. <laughs> See you at Tinnerbell. <laughs> Bye, guys.